Okay, welcome to Navigating Back to School. This is an open discussion about learning pods, remote classes, and hybrid schools. So this is a sort of a town hall session. And uh, we definitely have a presentation in store for you, but we're going to leave opportunity for you to ask questions because we know many of you have joined today because you have loads of questions about um, the upcoming school year. And some of you may have already started the uh, school year. Okay, why are we here? Well, it's no surprise that, you know, school is starting, as I stated before, and we have a pandemic that is a big, big concern for many parents. And um, parents are rightfully concerned about the safety of how this school year is going to play out. It's very stressful. And we have parents that have multiple kids, uh, some parents that will have their kids entering kindergarten for the first time, and lots of navigation and different options that have been just sort of sparking up um, across the nation and even the globe. So we wanted to take the time to definitely um, explore those options with you and definitely provide information um, to you. So today we're gonna discuss the different options that are available, things that have been percolating um, in the media and the news and um, some of you may not be on some of the social media channels So this is a great opportunity for you to get up to speed We'll talk more about what's happening in the public school system. So if you don't mind go ahead and put your um, City in the chat and if we have some specific information related to that we can certainly share that um, and I think what the big uh, Tada or brouhaha if you will is about these learning pods uh, which I just discovered uh, about two weeks ago. So it hadn't been that long <laughs> that Grace gave me a call and told me about, you know, what the parents were cooking up <laughs> mm -hmm. for the back to school season. And uh, we'll discuss that and, you know, obviously share some considerations regarding your decision making. Before we begin, make sure you're in a quiet place. Um, it's a good idea to put your phone on silent, close all the computer tabs, and have a pen and paper ready because today your facilitators are Lemmy and Grace. So not Will and Grace, but <laughs> Lemmy. We're Lemmy our own show, Lemmy. Our own show, yes. <laughs> we, our own show. Need, we need to get a show or a podcast. <laughs> We've been working together for how many years now, Grace? Oh God, at least eight, nine, something like that. Yes, a long time. yes. our kids have grown up together. We've yes. grown up yes. in our business and our personal life. My name is Lemiola Rinkatola, and I am a, uh, to say it shortly, a parent turned tutor. So I got charged up many moons ago about the educational concerns and issues, and um, over time, opened up my own tutoring and consulting company called The Critical Thinking Child. And we focus on fast tracking and academic acceleration and helping um, students in particular who are on the gifted and uh, selective enrollment track locally here in Chicago. Since COVID has hit, we have been 100% remote. And that's since March 12th of 2020. Every single day, we've been out teaching um, uh, through social media and even through our virtual summer camp. So we have many hours and many experiences um, in the remote learning arena. Grace? Yes, so I am um, parent uh, is my, <laughs> uh, you know, going into this whole uh, school school search uh, realm as a parent and um, but over time, you know, having kids going through this not being from uh, this area where we're based in Chicago um, and trying to navigate it really ended up just uh, finding out that there are a lot of options. Um, School is constantly changing. It's very organic. Um, Lemmy and I partnered up because Lemmy is great at being able to, you know, just like, all right, if there's, we tell everybody, you know, school's not not the only way to learn, um, you know, in those four walls. Um, so Lemmy over, over time, certainly all her resources and everything are to not, you know, enrichment, tutoring, sure, but enrichment and everything like that. So um, it's been great to just discover all these different ways to learn, uh, styles to learn, and helping families understand that. So that's what we do. Um, and, and definitely finding a school <laughs> because you don't want to be homeschooling your kid all the time. But, you know, so, so yes, our, our main space is helping to find schools, but at the same time, 
trying to supplement. Yes. Yeah. I think all the parents can agree that they need a break, right? Yes. Uh, but, you know, we, I've got experience with the sort of pod development through the teacher strike and just uh, homeschooling experience. So that's one of the things we can share today. And so this is our big overarching problem, which is really um, the cause of why our nation is, has offered the remote learning um, experience. And, you know, quite frankly, that experience in the spring when COVID hit wasn't um, based on the feedback and the district. I know it varied across the country, but many of the students um, felt isolated, frustrated. Um, they missed that personal contact. And same thing with the teachers too. The teachers weren't as prepared. They didn't really have a lot of lead time to uh, conduct uh, remote, more remote learning in the way that um, they felt would be ideal for their students. And so that left a lot of bad taste, if you can say, in the parents' mouth, because at the same time, parents found themselves at home juggling work, uh, trying to facilitate the remote learning environment for um, you know, their, their kid, and if they had more than one child in different age groups, that was uh, a big problem as well. So I think everyone had some level of stress dealing with uh, the situation. Well, um, COVID is still here. <laughs> and so we still have to deal with alternative learning models going forward. And, um, so what has happened as a result of that? Well, some parents have, and we'll talk more about this, but you know, we have some parents like Grace and I who are really like go-getters, right? And so um, during this changing environment and because remote learning is new, we want it to be a good experience. And we know that parents are juggling things with their work um, and family life and really trying to get a routine and a schedule um, together. And it's very overwhelming. And what we're finding is that there are different options now, options that really weren't talked about in the spring. And so if you haven't had a chance to keep up with all the media, I mean, I know it could be overwhelmed with all the different topics and, you know, this being a political year and, and so forth, um, that there are different scenarios, okay? One in which that we're very familiar with is the in-person learning option, okay? So if you think back to just the, uh, a year ago, that's what the students were experiencing, you know, going to school five days a week and, you know, parents buying all those back to school supplies and so forth and getting ready to get their kids on the bus. Um, the remote learning option is not really new. It goes by different names depending on, you know, the academic level. You may hear virtual learning, distance learning. I know within the critical thinking child, we were already doing remote learning overseas for well over a year ago. Um, but what we can say is that it's now a common, a common household term, right? Wouldn't you agree with that? So what it means is that you are learning, you know, 100% of the time via live or pre-recorded video lessons. So it's remote. You're not actually in the school setting. There is a hybrid model that many of the districts uh, were um, considering or are still considering, depending on what state you live in. Um, not everyone here is uh, from the same state, but the hybrid model really uh, is a blend of face-to-face -face interaction, so that classroom environment, uh, teacher in front of a uh, group of students, and then also having an online instruction option. So perhaps you, um, and I'm, I, this is one scenario we have seen um, from other states is that the students may go to school twice a week, and then have one day remote with their uh, teacher and then two days doing project-based learning. But the structure can be, you know, designed in, in different and multiple ways. So it's just a hybrid of face-to-face -face interaction and online instruction. So if you hear that term, that's what they're referring to in most cases. Now what's happening in the public school system? And we'll talk uh, more about the, the private aspect as well, but the vast majority of the students in this nation are attending public schools. Uh, just recently, um, if you're in Chicago, you may or may not be aware of this. Uh, Chicago announced just a few days ago that they were going full remote as far as reopening um, their reopening plans for the fall. 
Now, initially, Chicago had released like a 212 model, um, hybrid model, and uh, now it's uh, full remote. And so these things uh, may change depending on data, decisions that are made by governing body. Uh, so I guess as parents, our takeaway on this is that, you know, don't hold your breath and think that, <laughs> you know, information is going to stay uh, the same. We have to be flexible. I think we really have to be flexible and adaptable. Um, but many of you I know are very frustrated because you're ready to get into a routine and you're really concerned about whether your child is missing out on learning um, due to disruption, right? And are there any learning gaps and issues that you should uh, be aware of and how can you uh, be sure of that and address it? So across the nation, um, you know, different hybrid models that we already talked about. Um, hybrid models, in, in case you're interested, what we have found is that those uh, approaches tend to be really good for independent students who can work at home. I have three uh, students who did uh, remote uh, from March until um, July working from home and you know they did it all independently. They had the devices, they logged on, they handled their own schedule. Now my, my students are older but you know hybrid model can work for different age groups. Um, it really depends on how independent that student is. So I've seen success in the hybrid model even the students as young as like third grade, fourth grade, and fifth grade. Um, however, in some cases, um, depending on the type of learning style, um, parents still have to try to juggle childcare, right? Um, because of the stay at home order, uh, some parents are not able to have the, um, let's drop our kids off and go to work and follow that routine. So they're doing everything at home, even, trying to keep up with making sure that uh, their child isn't goofing off when they're supposed to be doing remote learning, right? Um, how do you know if you're, how do you stay on top of it, as I say? Because uh, they could be um, pretty savvy these days where they could switch a screen and be playing a video game. So we have parents who, who just want more um, assurance that their child is uh, learning. And this can also present problems um, um, about educational continuity, which we kind of talked about, you know, those learning gaps for parents who are just used to that five days a week, my kids are in school and, um, you know, the weekends we get to do different activities. So that's starting to become more and more like, you know, an older approach. But in private schools, what's happening there? They have more flexibility. Um, they have different approaches. Um, you know, they can set up different rules and less regulation, right? Because they're not getting that, in most cases, government funding. So they may not have to adhere to certain regulations that public schools have to adhere to. So there is some flexibility with the private schools. I've seen some local private schools that um, are open and they have started class in person, face-to-face. -face. And um, I've seen, you know, protocols where they have social distancing protocols in place, the face mask and all kinds of things. So it just really depends on, you know, the, the private school. You'll have to judge that on a case by case basis. Now what's going on when the parents are in control? Boy, <laughs> as parents, um, when we get impatient, I think you might agree, we, some of us will start taking the bull by its horn and coming up with our own solution. I know I tend to do that at times. So if you're a parent like me, go ahead and type a one into the chat. I don't want to feel like I'm alone. <laughs> Grace, I, think I, the, I think the whole reason why everyone's on this uh, webinar is because we're all like that. So. Yes, indeed. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. what are learning pods? Let's get to that. Well, here's a nice little um, quote that I found on the internet that I thought was really, really cute, two peas in a pod. But what is it? So with learning pods, these, uh, it's really a terminology um, that is really percolating. Now there's two uh, main types, I should say, when we're talking about academic pods, because there are different types of pods. But when we're talking about academic pods, we have the remote learning enrichment pod, which is really designed to complement that virtual uh, school experience. So if you have a school that's providing uh, virtual work, um, 
along with in-person uh, component. Um, many parents are getting a group of parents together so that they can share resources, support each other, you know, really stay on top of the game, so to speak. And this typically in involves several families with children of similar ages and skill level, okay? Now, what do we call the micro schools? I've heard micro schools, I've heard nano schools. Don't be surprised if tomorrow there's another term for the same definition, right? <laughs> so these are sort of larger than your remote learning pods, but smaller than a typical school. So it really is um, a more established curriculum and it often takes place of the traditional schooling altogether. So this would be in lieu of the traditional schooling um, in, in placement of. So a student wouldn't do both. They wouldn't do the micro school and do, let's say the public school. Like that would be probably academically too much with the time involved in that. So parents are pulling their resources together and forming these pods that are conducive for, for their, you know, for their lifestyle. And there's been talks in the media about why are these pods popping up? Well, one is childcare. It's been just an overwhelming, in many cases, if I dare say burden um, with respect to time management for parents who just uh, didn't have enough resources to juggle taking care of their kids and working full time, even though it's remotely at, and at home in the comfort of their home. It's just a lot to manage, especially when you have um, young children, but then it could be a lot to manage with you know, teenagers as well. It all depends on that situation. Socialization. Uh, we have different personalities, different learning styles, and we know that some um, kids are just more what we call um, social butterflies or you know, great debaters. They love movement and um, learning through their hands and, and just really getting really physical in terms of their learning experience and they miss that social interaction with their kids and their peers. Um, so that's something that's you know, really uh, missing and they, even being able to you know, go outside. Uh, safety concerns, you know, how do we uh, keep uh, the kids safe? And, and many parents are really concerned about going back into the school system. And um, I don't know, I think this morning they had a school in Georgia where um, they weren't mandated to wear facial masks and um, school has started and they had a picture of a crowded hallway. And for many parents, that's concerning to them. You know, they wanna make sure that when they send their kids back, that their kids are safe. And so some parents are really concerned. And so they're forming this pod because they feel better about controlling the safety, like less people, they're not exposed to a larger population. And then also for remote learning support, uh, because many parents, even in the pod situation, they're still going to adhere to uh, the remote learning curriculum that their school district is providing. But at the same time, they have to work. They have to work their nine to five. And they're doing all of that on the computer and work can be very demanding. So they just wanna make sure that they have support even to maybe make sure that the child is completing um, the remote assignments that the teachers are providing, uh, making sure that they're maximizing their potential and their learning opportunity across all subjects and so forth. So there are various reasons why these pods are being uh, developed. And these are really good rational reasons. Um, the other thing to consider is what are the key considerations for the development of these pods? Well, two key considerations, or at least buckets, if you will, are the cost and the logistics. So many uh, parents who are interested in um, starting their own pod will have to think about these questions. So if that's a parent like you, here are some questions that, you know, we just like for you to just ponder and think about, you know, where will you find the families to partner with? So remember, these pods are, you know, a group of small families getting together along with their kids you know, similar um, skills and age group. And, you know, we're here in Chicago and Chicago is really spread out. <laughs> so if any of you have been in Chicago, it's really spread out. And even though you may live in your neighborhood, your closest family members may not be in your neighborhood. So 
you know, you have to consider how will we partner that? And we know this because pre-COVID, um, I had my kids going to two different schools. So, you know, we were driving from one school to the next. And, and that's how it was for a typical family. Many families in Chicago were uh, driving their kids to different schools. Like it was almost like you won the lottery if you had <laughs> your kids in one school. Yes, <laughs> you know, that was very, that was, rare. <laughs> <laughs> very rare. Where are you going to host the pod? Think about where would that be? You know, some are thinking of using their basement and open space. Other are thinking, other people are thinking about leasing. You have to also think about, you know, who's going to attend? Are you going to hire a teacher? Um, you know, will that teacher come cert become certified? And is it a retired teacher? Or are you pulling a teacher out uh, from an existing uh, job with a public school? And then how many, how many children? So all of these are the same, like frequently asked questions that are coming up. And it, for example, what I've seen is I've seen one teacher, three to nine students, five days a week. And that's just one scenario, okay? Um, being an educator, you know, I have lots of years of experience, you know, private tutoring, small group tutoring, remote tutoring, um, consulting, et cetera. So I know based on my experience what my comfort level would be in order to uh, manage a student and the number of students and their grade level and so forth. So, you know, just making sure that our parents are interviewing in the right way and uncovering that information, it, it is a huge, huge undertaking. You know, the development of this pod is a serious thing. And don't even talk about the protocols. Like when you develop this pod, you need to put agreements in place. How are you going to get the families to adhere to a certain set of rules? Uh, for example, let's say if you're renting a space, like some parents are actually looking to lease out a space, are they going to have uh, mask on for everyone until you get to the space. And then when you get to the space, mask off. You know, I don't know. That'll be up to the, you know, the pod family and the pod leader to sort of, you know, come to those agreements. So these contracts, these legal agreements, insurances, even how they decide to set up and what supplies they buy are pretty much being developed, you know, pod by pod with some support being offered through town halls and webinars like the ones we're providing you know, today to share resources with you on what we've seen. Um, it's critically important to follow government guidelines and mandates, even if you're considering doing your own pod or your micro school for that matter. Now, can you guess, let's make sure you could see this, one problem with the what you're calling pandemic pods, right? So pods are not really new by definition, but these pandemic pods are really, in my opinion, coming out of a panic state, right? We got to do something quickly. School is starting. Um, how can we fix the problem? And sometimes, you know, people may think throwing money at the situation is the problem fixer. That does not always work. Now, let's look at the cost involved in this, okay? And so we're not today taking one position or the other. We're just sharing the facts with you, sharing the resources. And then we want to open the floor up and hear what you have to say. So the investment can vary. So big cities like Chicago, New York, and Los Angeles easily cost to have your child, a single child, in a pod can be $2,500 per month. Okay. I've seen um, arrangements where some private uh, uh, teachers um, are, you know, asking for 150 per week per child. Um, some parents are even uh, being generous enough to hire a teacher and a college student as a teacher's aide. So it just really depends on, you know, the situation. And I don't, I hate to say it, but how desperate <laughs> the parents may be in that situation. So pods are pricey. And they tend to be popular among the privileged because not everyone can afford that, you know? And then we have the issue um, or the concern about equality in education. There's been a lot of, you know, discussion in the news about inequality 
And, you know, what is the impact when we put on our critical thinking hats? What is the impact of these pods? You know, every time there's some type of innovation, and this holds true no matter what the innovation is. I learned this a long time ago. There's always pros and there's always cons, right? So even though there are pros to the learning pods, what are the cons? It may actually pull funding out from um, certain school districts. Um, and, and many feel that it may widen the educational and learning gap for those who are you know, low income, or underserved, or who are already feeling very strained about not getting a high quality level of education. Think about the impact of starting a pod, um, what, what would be the impact to your local school district? Because there may be a situation where the pod is only temporarily, it's a temporary situation, just like um, the pod that um, I developed years ago, that was uh, to fill a need because it was a teacher strike. I think that one um, went on for like two, at least two weeks, right? And so immediately we had the pod set up in the home, the curriculum, different age groups, the whole thing. But the intent was eventually we get back into the school system at some point. So make sure you're thinking long term and not short term with your decisions. Um, and think about the enriched remote learning pod, which is, uh, you know, a situation where you can still have, you know, hired help, support. Um, for your students at home and you are following um, the school's curriculum, but you're also giving your child that extra because we know there are some kids that can just really fly and they're fast finishers. And what do you do when they finish fast and um, they're ready for the next? So you don't want them just playing video games. You want to make sure that they're constantly being challenged and that they're constantly growing. And so uh, remote learning pods and support in that arena tends to be very beneficial. Here's an example of one of the pictures from Sharon P. Uh, so Sharon gave permission for us to share inside of her, her home here. She's putting together her, her home-based learning pod. And I think what she's done is just so quite unique. It's very cozy, quaint. She's got I think under nine kids. And um, I asked her about her glass tables because I thought those were so neat. And she responded and said she got them on clearance at Staples, you know, which is really, really cool. And she selected the glass because she wanted to be able to see, um, you know, she's going to tape some different, um, I guess, activities uh, for uh, the students on, on that particular desk space. So it was intentional for her to choose a glass um, fixture. Others are choosing different types of fixture. This is from Jamie O in Fort Lauderdale, um, Florida. Um, thank you, Jamie, for sharing your photo with us. And so here inside of Jamie's home, she has begun to set up these, um, you know, small, cozy learning environments, mini classrooms. And um, I have to say, that as a private tutor, <laughs> uh, when I would go and do home visits, I don't do them as much anymore, but when I would do home visits, I would see something similar to this, I'm not gonna lie, where parents will have their walls decorated, um, a home library. Uh, it just seems like the only difference now, instead of for one or two, you've got to set it up for like four or more, right? So these middle, mid, um, mini classrooms are, probably not new for many of us parents. We've done something along these lines in some fashion, right? So here's Jamie Murphy. Jamie is just getting started. He, um, he let me know that he has about nine um, students and that he is going to uh, continue to work on his design and then he'll share some updated pictures. But in looking at this, I thought this would just be great for a remote where kids can sit on the chairs They'll have their Chromebooks, laptops, and they can still, you know, start learning from that fashion. So it doesn't have to always be a desk in some um, format. And plus, he can remove the chairs and use the floor space, um, you know, maybe add a bean bag. I'm not an interior decorator, but I can give him some pointers <laughs> on how to make it cozy. So what would you want 
um, to make uh, the best choice for your child? What would you need? And let's talk about how we can make that happen. So Grace and I are here. We gave you a little bit about our background. Um, I'm gonna take it off the slides or Grace, um, we're gonna allow um, the parents to kind of share their ideas. I do have a poll though. So I'm thinking maybe I should do the poll before we open it up for questions, but we are ready to hear from you. We've left enough time so that um, we can hear your thoughts, your ideas and, and your questions and see how we can be of help. Okay, so first right. I'll do the poll. Is it okay you if do I- do the poll. Yeah, okay. you do the poll. And I just wanna say as, as people, as you're getting that up, I mean, um, the thing that I am always um, not, you know, conscious of, um, and why I started, you know, with trying to help families find schools is because I, I do feel that this inequity is, um, is, is just like the biggest travesty of, of, you know, U.S. education, honestly. And um, so, you know, pandemic pods, uh, unfortunately, they do start to separate. Um, and, and certainly it's much easier for, for some families than it is for others, um, whether it's space, whether it's resources, you know, just even um, computer and internet uh, bandwidth. So I, I did want to say that, like, yes, that would be probably the easiest, quickest um, first, first line of defense is to try and set this up. Um, you know, whether or not it's just uh, parent sharing time where everybody, you know, in an in, in area, neighborhood, um, maybe a parent takes a day each or two days. And then, you know, there's, there's an, at least a sort of hybrid learning, but with the families. Um, CPS, Chicago is, is going all remote. So at least until they said November 9th, I'm um, not sure what's going to happen to determine after that. But basically, you know, there's going to be this need um, for at least, I understand. I mean, if we can just share resources, that may be the best way, but there are definitely parents who have to be out of the house, who, who are essential workers, who, who cannot necessarily, you know, just leave their kids to their own devices. So um, being able to, to understand that and try and find creative ways, I would love it if we can, you know, solve that <laughs> or uh, have better options for that. So, so right now, um, yeah. All right. So the poll's going. Uh, if you see the poll. Okay. And so, yeah, we've got the poll results, actually. They should be on the screen. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so it looks like the vast majority on the call, 70, 70, 77 77% actually remote or distant learning, 8% um, hybrid, is that 23% homeschooling? Right. And 15% doing the learning pod, 15% doing the learning pod. So we've got a good mixture. Um, In-person schooling was not selected. Um, okay, so we've got a good mixture. This is a good, and you know, things may change, but we've got some opportunities for some good discussions. So go ahead, get started with your questions. Let's see how we can be of help. And, and we also want to say that there are, um, homeschooling has been around for a long time, right? I mean, actually before the whole public school institution came about, which somebody was, I was talking to somebody that was like only 150 years ago. I mean, really homeschooling wow. was kind of it, right? Before that yeah. or small, you know, one room schoolhouses, that kind of thing, um, where, where, but this homeschooling, uh, um, uh, there's there's a camp of homeschoolers who have been homeschooling, you know, throughout it all, and and do want to emphasize that there's a difference between homeschooling, um, and and you know just basically teaching your kid in the time of not having a school available. Um, so homeschooling is very purposeful. It is absolutely you know letting a child certainly. Um, the different ways that they learn, uh, tapping into that. So certainly, you know, even within a homeschool, you can have um, your kids be different, different experiential learners um, modalities. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, so it's more. It's it's definitely more um, 
thought out um, homeschool as you know, and using the resources of the city, and which you don't necessarily have now um, with everything right. you know being safety conscious and stuff. So, so it's different um, with that regard. And I know a lot of homeschoolers take offense <laughs> to right now this time of like, oh, you know, everybody's calling themselves homeschoolers when when there is a little difference. So just yeah, there, there is, and there's I think above all this difference in experience and so forth. Um, yes. Go ahead and type into the Q&A. I had mentioned earlier to put it into the chat, but I think if you don't mind putting your question into the Q&A, it's a lot easier for us to pull it and navigate. I see the first question. Um, Grace, can you read that out? Right. So, well, the one um, Jay Slavin had mentioned, you can't control who the families are exposed to and your kids should still get you know, could still get infected absolutely positively. So that's why at least the learning pods, um, families, it seems like families who are finding each other are of similar mindset, of similar philosophies in terms of, you know, how, how serious, how protocols, all that stuff. Um, so that's part of the process is vetting who, who you are choosing to be part of this, um, you know, group um, because it's going to be very difficult if you have different philosophies of families and ones you know every weekend they're having you know all gatherings in their basement versus others or have just ever since March been shut down so mm -hmm. um, where can we look Sophia says where can we look for teachers to lead learning pods yes so I have been curating resources on some of the frequently asked questions we shared just a few with you today but I'm putting together sort of a survival guide for parents and I can just give you a couple um, right now, but that survival guide should be ready in about a week. Um, so we've got another um, town hall midweek of next week. And then after that, we review your questions, then we should have that guide available. And um, we trust that's going to be a, a time saver for you. So just real quick, we have, um, cares.com you may have already um, heard of that organization so cares.com um, has been a good resource uh, for some parents so we definitely want to you know mention that um, there's wise ant and I have to spell it for you w y z is in zebra a n t dot com wise com and they have a whole slew of tutors and they even um, when COVID came about, um, was transforming their platform to offer more remote tutoring services. I will say that with Wiseant, we have experience with Wiseant in um, our consulting firm, uh, but it really is uh, going to take somebody who knows how to interview, not just look at what's on paper. And I think that's with any organization. Let me just caution you on that. So um, all of this is just uh, a starting point for you, but to really find someone special who's going to care for and, and, and really be, you know, conducive and fit within your family goals and guidelines, you're going to have to, you know, put together some type of interview structure and um, assessment maybe just to make sure you find the right fit. It's not an easy job. It's not at all especially with all the noise because you have you know you have people who are in other field who are now switching over um to become tutors um and so it it the tutoring industry <laughs> the private tutoring industry is really you know you're getting a plethora of opportunities and so forth but that doesn't mean everyone is like qualified you know that type of thing so um those two i would say and then also a company by the name of um parachute i believe mm -hmm. is now starting to they reached out to providers and said hey we want to help um you know parents who are interested in this learning pod and we want to perhaps list your services as a provider and then maybe also see if any of you can offer scholarships for uh those who cannot afford it so uh, what I like about the discussion with them is that they're also thinking about those who are less fortunate and seeing if there can be some scholarship opp opportunity. And so um, I'm not sure what phase they're in in all of this. I do know that it's worth taking a look at what they're doing. 
um, because they are doing something, you know, relative to um, supporting parents and then also helping organizations, which is wonderful, and the community. So those three I would definitely start with. Yeah, you know, and and I, I would say, I think it's called Parachute Kids, so I'm going to have to re read okay, that. Um, but basically, yeah, I'm just trying to double check and see what they're, I think it's parachutekids.com. I don't know. Um, so, so what I also want to say is that um, with the fact that there are, uh, unfortunately, a lot of universities making changes to what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, if you, you know, it's not the ideal, but if you are just looking for a guide where um, a lot of people have certainly in Chicago, CPS has um, their own curriculum. They have um, many, you know, they, they have the ideal of trying to say, okay, from September 8th onward, um, they're going to go ahead and have a slightly longer school day, a little bit more of um, um, live interaction with, with uh, parents, or students, I mean, um, so that that's their change from spring to now. Um, but maybe there is going to still be uh, obviously a need for um, the time that there are, you know, the kids are still not live uh, instruction, maybe if they can have a guide. Um, some, some, some college students are taking year, a year off, uh, deferring. A gap year, yeah. Um, a gap, exactly. And so that is, it's just something that is, could, uh, could be another possibility. But again, it's not a teacher who is certified in a subject area. So you can have all different levels, um, honestly. Um, so that's just something to think about. So yeah. it's parachutekids.com with pair. So I'm going to type that in the, okay, in the chat. You got to type that in as a resource. Yeah. That'd be great. And then what, if you're wondering, you know, I had mentioned parent turn, private tutor turn, you know, educator, et cetera. We're um, working in the remote space. So we can certainly provide remote academic support and definitely guidance for parents um, as far as the curriculum. Like I said, we operate on an academic acceleration level so we know how to um, get kids to move faster learn faster um, we do assessments to close that gap and i think one of the biggest pieces that's really missing um, is that parents haven't had that year-end testing right and right. more than likely the beginning of the year testing will probably be waived um, that's to be determined but it's you know, it's a big, you know, possibility. And so you, as a parent, if your child was, maybe the last time your child actually had a standardized test was um, for some parents, maybe January, first two couple of weeks in January for the winter session, some of them even was the fall, you may be looking at nine months to a year um, before your child is tested. So how do you know about that growth? How can you gauge it? Well, we, we've been doing standardized um, assessment testing all summer long, you know, since uh, the COVID outbreak. Uh, so if you're interested in, uh, you know, getting help with pinpointing where your child is, what their strengths are in math and reading, um, you know, language arts. Um, and when we're talking about those subjects, we're talking about really fine tuning, like for example, math, is it fractions or is it multiplication? Is it um, decimals, like, you know, really being able to pinpoint where their struggles are and then um, helping you put together a plan of action. And that plan can then be a supplement to whatever choice you're making, you know, uh, the learning pod model, the remote uh, model, the hybrid model, um, you know, that could be part of the enrichment curriculum just to make sure that uh, your child is still growing at um, an appropriate rate year after year. I think, you know, for me as a parent, that would be one of my biggest concerns. Um, and so, and how do I do that? That's something that at this point in time, reaching out to a consultant, you know, like what we offer in services and saying, hey, let me get a baseline before school starts. I want to know the starting point. And then maybe, you know, um, in the winter or after Thanksgiving, maybe do another assessment and, and measure that growth. Um, because these, like we said, these pods, they're costly. You're investing not just your money, but your time. 
and time that you really can't get back if you're trading that time for what would be family time, the family dinners, the walk in the park, um, just enjoying the time of being a parent that's being sacrificed while you do this management of, you know, their educational, you know, experience, which is very important. But one of the things is that I know personally for me, I don't like to travel on the path without data. So one of the secrets to my success and to my students' success and those families that have, you know, joined my community is that they travel along the path with me and they are knowledgeable about what their child is able to do and how to move their child forward. Okay. So I see we have a couple more questions here. Well, um, I don't know. I just saw that um, Angela said <laughs> she will connect with us later, but she had said awesome, refreshing session. Okay. Um, Thank you, so, Angela. Thank you. And, uh, but I, I really missed anybody. If anybody has a question that they didn't get answered, um, please add it to the chat. Um, but we talked about teachers and learning pods. I mean, there are, you know, I, I don't love social media cause it's a huge time suck, but I will say yeah. that Facebook yeah. has, um, some, some, a lot of resources. I mean, everything, this is also new guys. This is definitely like, as I was telling Lemmy two weeks ago, you know, yeah. we were sort of, um, it, it just came up about in our realm uh, is certainly there's a lot of articles, uh, now, you know, New York times, Washington post, Los Angeles times, you know, a lot of, um, um, different communities kind of making it up as they go um, and certainly other companies you know in, in terms of like pairing you know um, different different needs and whatnot um, but parachute is great because they do have a, a a questionnaire which asks you like you know what are you looking for what is your philosophy what is you know so so that there there are um, these resources out there to help you kind of filter like even what kind of questions you need to to know and ask about yeah. so so look at that um but you know what what really is to know is just that it's constantly changing it's constantly forming there is no one right way to do this um and just with education in general i mean you know there's no one right way to do that so yeah there's we, no yeah and, and i see here that um we have parents that entered into the Q&A that they have multiple kids with different age groups, um, an eight-year-old, an 11-year-old, um, a 12-year-old going into um, seventh grade, uh, second grader. Um, and just to address, from, yeah, go ahead, let me. No, I was going to say that I had gotten an email um, earlier that one parent whose um, child was about to enter kindergarten, that they were considering red shirting and just holding back a year to see how things would, you know, um, shake out. Now, in that district, it's all in person. So mm, um, the right. parent was contemplating that. Um, and to be honest with you, even with my, um, my own kids who are at the co collegiate level, we have the same questions that you do. Like, you know, are they going back? Right. If they're going it's back or they're doing remote or, um, and how, how the safety precautions going to be put mm -hmm. in place. So, you know, um, as long as you have a child in school, <laughs> you, you still have these same concerns. It's not like, Oh, that person, that parent doesn't have to worry about it. No, we right. all have the concerns all the way from, you know, the beginning. Preschool through college. Yeah, through yes. college. It, Grad it school. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, I did want to say, so for the seventh graders, you know, historically in Chicago, seventh grade was always a very fraught year with um, the fact that in, in pre-pandemic times, um, your, your child's seventh grade final grades and um, their um, standardized testing was utilized for what's called selective enrollment in high schools. So um, that was a very fraught year. Um, CPS uh, has not announced, I doubt they even had time to think about um, that piece of selective enrollment and also for you know four-year-olds who are looking into kindergarten or just any year basically CPS has selective enrollment available for kindergarten through ninth grade um, so none of the metrics for how families or how students uh, test in have been released. Um, but we do know that, yes, as Lemmy said, no standardized testing has gone on, so they haven't been able to, to um, 
you know, redesign something. In the collegiate piece though, because Lemmy and I both have college students, right. we have noticed that, um, you know, SATs and ACTs used to be such a huge um, component, but all throughout uh, from, from March all the way until now, I just heard, you know, August uh, exams are canceled. So, so there's no ACT, SAT piece and, and the colleges like, well, so far, um, thankfully, have said that they are test optional. I don't know how elementary schools um, and going into high school is going to be able to do that quite as much because they have fewer metrics than a college would. A college has essays, recommendations, you know, course, rigor of coursework, etc. Um, but it, they don't have it for the elementary school entry um, and, and the high school piece right now. So that is yet to be uh, determined. Mm -hmm. And so that's so interesting because uh, we know the college experience, the college application all too well. And if they remove that element, or even temporarily of the test component, they're going to rely more heavily on the other components, which means your child's experience, whether it's a remote setting, a learning pod that you develop, what they get out of that academically is mm -hmm. going to be very important, very important. Absolutely. Um, and could potentially make the difference in terms of what colleges they end up going to down the road. So again, we come back to the curriculum, we come back to the assessments because like I said, that was my peace of mind, you know, in making sure, you know, we have the right curriculum and, you know, we're assessing and so forth. Um, and, and like I said, we are curating this and, you know, I'm so grateful for, you know, Grace, because she called me up, you know, and I'm doing virtual uh, summer camps since June 22nd every single day and then remote um, teaching on the weekend and she called me up and she's like let me let me these, these learning pods <laughs> <laughs> let's talk <laughs> well, let's talk what are we gonna do <laughs> and so you know naturally I had to get up to speed really quickly and so my team and I we have been just every day reading um, interviewing I've been interviewing parents you saw some of those pictures that the parents have shared Everyone's got a little twist on how they're doing it. And they're also um, leaning on, on coaches and consultants like us for support. So, you know, I've been able to give them some, some tips on structure and, and things of that nature, um, some ideas on agreements and, and, and things of that, wherever I can kind of learn as well as lend a hand. So what is coming out of that is just sort of a, a guidebook. I think with all the information that we're starting to just gather to kind of put some of those things in one place. And um, if you didn't hear it before, uh, we have another town hall for those who couldn't, you know, make it on the weekend. We're doing one during the week. And then after we sort of get those questions, we'll have this guidebook uh, made available uh, to you. So if you're watching the replay and you're looking for a takeaway or a, um, uh, what to do next, uh, look forward to um, getting information about how to get your hands on that and how to access that, because uh, that's going to prove to be very valuable. We're, we're doing all the, the dirty, <laughs> the nitty gritty <laughs> work and um, that type of thing of trying to make, help you make sense of it, whether or not um, you decide to go that route, whatever route you decide to go is going to have some impact because as they say, we're all in this together. Um, you know, what I do on my end, the decisions I make may actually, you know, impact, um, you know, just the system altogether, right? So we have to be sort of aware, aware of that at the very minimum. Right. Yeah. I mean, just uh, along that lines, as Lemon was saying, like, you know, we don't necessarily want people to pull out of public schools because the funding is such that it's really tied to, you know, but, but if you wanted to supplement, we totally understand, you know, that kind of thing, uh, you know, cause there's, there's, we all went through uh, spring <laughs> and, and dealing with all of the <laughs> education that happened, but that was a triage um, level. And, yeah. and now hopefully the summer um, through different opportunities for the teachers, 
teachers, I mean, they, they know they needed to, um, the district knew, the teachers knew they needed to, you know, revamp. So we're hoping that that has happened. Um, very hopeful that that has happened and, and that there are just better, better modalities, modalities and, and offerings this fall. But at the same time, any, any caring parent is going to try and see other ways to supplement. Um, but um, so, you know, we're here to just help give you some resources for that. Our next town hall is uh, Wednesday evening, 7 okay. p.m. Um, Central Time. Um, however you registered for this, you know, go back to that source. Um, but, and we each have our own websites. Um, so I, down below yeah. and feel free yeah. to attend again because there's new developments every day right um, so every day <laughs> yeah it may we had to change some slides real quickly with fresh news that we got um and this slide deck was already uh set to go and we had to do some tweaks and we may have to do that again depending on you know what comes up in the new development so you know feel free to join us and 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 come back again and if you have questions that'll be a good a good time to share your questions. Don't be shy. Um, you, we are the pioneers in this. Like somebody's got to be the pioneers when this all starts off, and it's us. <laughs> so right, we are shaping the future for the you know, for the future. If you right. will. Um, I just I just saw this other feature that says Q and A so quickly. Okay. <laughs> so answer live. Um, we're gonna answer live. Uh, so we looked about look look for teachers for learning pods. Um, uh, we did that. So it, are, if you are supplementing CPS curriculum, should you try to reach out to the students, parents in the same class or school? Could this be um, successful with kids across different schools? Potentially, yes, absolutely. Especially if you're in. The CPS curriculum. Um, let me. I don't know if you want, but like certainly, yes, it helps in the same class. Absolutely. Okay, so, so um, break down the question for me again. I think I have an answer. If you're supplementing the CPS curriculum, should you yeah. try to reach out to students or parents in the same class or school, or could this be successful with kids across different schools? Oh, okay. Well, I know we've had great success across different schools, <laughs> so that we put into play, and they have the CPS curriculum. So it, it you really just take someone who's able to 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 juggle um, a topic across the grade levels. Um, that's what you want to look for. Um, and so you can teach, like the, for example, the way we're teaching our summer camp right now. Um, let's say our topic is fractions, and we have a second grader, third grade, you know, um, sixth grader there, and and maybe a few of them from the same class. Um, and others from different schools. So we are able to, you know, finesse that because we know it's fractions and then they get um, a different level of assignment based on where their assessment was. That's coming back to the assessment. We wouldn't be able to uh, be as effective as we are without assessing. So we assess the kids first and then we knew how to stretch and navigate um, each one of them, even though they're sharing the same breakout session in some cases, so they're in like a virtual classroom together, right? And they're learning um, at a level that's comfortable for them. Uh, they don't feel left behind and they don't feel like they're moving too fast. And that's gonna be important. But we've had, you know, six straight months, nonstop virtual uh, remote training to be able to be this proficient. And then even pre-COVID, we were doing remote training. So. We're really ahead of um, a lot of the, you know, educators out there who are just, you know, getting introduced to this for the first time. So ask us for questions. Um, we're going to start doing trainer, um, train to trainer for teachers to kind of get them up to speed as well. So just look out for more support information. So that was an excellent question. Right. Do we have and, any and other questions? Delilah has, uh, what are some strategies to set up effective remote learning? I think we touched on them in different ways throughout the, the webinar. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, as, as uh, let me, if you wanted to read it. Oh yeah, absolutely. This will come in the survival guide. So it's going to be some more detailed step-by-step -step strategies. If you're talking about the infrastructure of, um, you know, how the study space should look like. Um, we're going to share some tips on, on that. Um, we even have some tips on uh, just how to, you know, make it feel more cohesive, um, like the experience more cohesive and more engaging. So we have some who are, they show up, they log on, right? 
uh, to the platform, whether it's Zoom or Google Chat, um, but they're not engaging. They're listening to the instructor, but they don't know how to do that uh, two-way feedback in a remote setting. So we, we have some tips and um, some lessons learned to help those who are more of an introvert, um, you know, express their, their selves, let the instructor know that they are learning so that they are not just left behind because, you know, they are not an extrovert. So um, that'll be coming in our um, survival survival guide, which will be out uh, very shortly, probably end of next week. Great. And, and that was it. And then I think that we're on, on time or well, a little bit over, but <laughs> a little bit over time. Okay. Did we get all the questions though? Yes. That's all. Oh, wait, okay. wait, hold on. I see, you know, you got to look in the box. Thank you. Thank you, Delilah. Oh, <laughs> that I hope awesome. that helps you. Okay, great. All right. All right, everyone. Next town hall, August 12th at 7 p.m. Central. Have a blessed day. Enjoy. Bye. Enjoy. Bye for now. Bye.